to room five. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You guys are the tried and true, the faithful. You're here for the 8.30 service. Can you give yourself a hand clap? Yeah. You didn't let the weather hold you back. We're just so glad that you're here this morning. If you're joining with us online, we're honored to have you as well. You may wonder why I'm up here this morning. I've been up here a lot recently. This is like a new, a new thing for me. Um, in our house this weekend, have you ever seen the episode of Friends where Ross is trying to take the couch up the stairs and he's yelling, pivot, pivot. And you know, um, Chandler starts telling him to shut up because he's annoyed with him, right? Um, this is what life was like in our house this weekend. A lot of pivoting, a lot of things that we had planned to do um, that we had to cancel. And Pastor Jay is under the weather. He is not feeling well at all. And so um, he looked at me and he said, I think I'm gonna be good on Saturday morning. And I said, honey, for everyone's sake, you are not good. You need to stay at home. So say a prayer for him. Um, he is frustrated that he can't be here this morning. But one thing I know about the God that we serve is he is never surprised by the pivot. He's never surprised by the pivot. And so he's here in this moment and he has something so specifically to speak to you, to speak to me. And so let's just go to him in prayer. Father God, I thank you for what you wanna do in this place this morning. God, I thank you that you have such a specific plan for every person that walk through these doors this morning. Right now, you're speaking hope, you're speaking life, you're speaking freedom in you. And so God, I just pray that we would take these few minutes and open our hearts up to receive your word. Your word is life to us. Help us to receive all that you have for us. I thank you that this is not about me, this is all about you. So have your way in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. We are starting in a new sermon series this week called Take the City. And this is probably gonna touch some, you know, hot buttons in all of our lives because it's all about our mouth, what we say, what we speak. And I know even in looking at Pastor Jonathan's notes for this week, I was like, man, there's a lot of areas in my life that I can grow in my speech. And so this is gonna be an area where we're gonna learn how to be patient in what we say and what we do. And so, you know, just lean in to all that God has for you. The average person knows about 10,000 words, but uses only about 5,000 of those in everyday speech. And those 5,000 words, they carry incredible power. I think we just don't realize the power that our words carry. Now, maybe you are an overachiever in your vocabulary. That's what I like to call my husband. If you've ever heard him preach and he said a word that you don't understand, he is an overachiever in his vocabulary. And I learned this really quickly when we were out to dinner one night and he asked me if I would like a serviette. And I looked at him and I said, what in the world is a serviette? Maybe you're an overachiever in your vocabulary. Anybody know what a serviette is in here? Okay, we've got a few overachievers. That is the British word for napkin. I'm not really sure. To this day, we joke about it when we go out to dinner. I'll say, would you like a serviette? Just because I think it's hilarious that he thought he needed to use the British word for napkin. But in reality, we all say thousands of words a day. Where are all my ladies at? Raise your hands. We say a lot more words than the guys normally. I mean, if we're just being being honest, but what you speak, the reality is what you speak can be your greatest weapon in your Christian walk, or it can be your greatest downfall. And that's just the truth of it. I want to tell you a story. Several years ago, Ikea did this experiment. They took two plants and they put them in the same environment for 30 days. The only thing that they changed about the environment was one of the plants received positive words over the plant, and the other plant received like negative words, almost like bullying. And then they measured this at the end, and remarkably, the plant that received positive words was healthy and growing, and the plant that received the negative words was limp and wilted. And in reality, what Ikea was studying is nothing that the Bible doesn't already tell us about words. If you look at Proverbs 18, 21 through 22, it says, wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. The tongue can bring death 
or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So the Bible has been saying this all along, that the power of your tongue, there's life and death in the power of your tongue. And I just love that the Bible compares wise words to a good meal. Anybody love a good meal out there? Any foodies in the room? Okay, I'm not alone. If you know me at all, I'm a huge foodie. I just got back from a trip to Pennsylvania with my family where I grew up. And one of the things that we love to do when we go home is to stop by all of our food spots and just eat all the amazing food. I literally went to my favorite donut shop and I told my sister, I said, oh man, I feel a little sick. And she's like, well, how many donuts did you just eat? And I said, three. And she's like, Amy, I was so excited because I love a good meal, and I love that God relates wise words to a good meal. Wise words in scripture mean that they yield or produce a harvest. See, God has called you to have wise words come out of your mouth, words that are going to yield and produce something. And if we're being honest, a lot of times the words that come out of our mouths, they're producing something but it's not at all what God has intended for us to produce. God wants you to produce a harvest, to bear good fruit in your life. I think of Solomon in the Bible, when God said he could ask for whatever he wanted. What did he ask for? He asked for wisdom and discernment to lead the people. And God honored him. God said, you know what? Because this is what you asked, I'm going to give you far more than that. He could have asked for long life. He could have asked for God to kill his enemies, right? He could have asked for all the wealth in the world. But what he cared about was that he would have wise words. And I think for you and for me, if we're going to walk this journey with Jesus and we're going to be all that he's called us to be, we have to care and desire wise words in our lives. If you look in the book of Genesis, isn't it interesting that we serve the God of all creation and he could have created in any way he wanted to, but how did he choose to create? Through words. He said, let there be light. He didn't have some secret handshake. He didn't have a magic wand. No, he spoke it into existence. That's the God that we serve. When he speaks something, it happens. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that when he speaks, things happen, that he's still doing that today? That wasn't just for then, that's for today. We serve a God that when he speaks, things start to happen. There's ground and territory that God wants you to take in your life. And it's going to require you to say the right things, to have a place in your heart and in your life where you are valuing wisdom and what you say. I went to a Steeler game. Any football fans in the room? Okay, there we go. I went to a Steeler game with my sisters and my parents this last week, and it was really neat because we don't get to do trips together. We left all of the husbands at home and made them watch the kids, and it was just kind of like a girl trip with my parents, which that's been a really long time since we've gotten to do that. And we went to the Steelers-Browns game. Really awesome experience. I don't know if you've ever been in a football arena, but just the energy in that place is amazing. I looked around and I thought, man, what would church be like if everybody was praising Jesus like they're waving their terrible towels? All right? I mean, the terrible towel was so fierce. I kid you not. I looked up and it was raining little yellow lint balls everywhere. They were getting stuck in my nose and driving me nuts. I looked at my sister and said, this is intense. But the passion and the unity in that place as everybody was waving their towel, it made me think, man, we need to get with it as we praise and worship Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that created us, the one that has has the plan in place for us. And you know what was really interesting to me? As I'm at this game, you know, I notice a few Browns fans, very small few, okay, because Steelers, we, we represent well. And in our little section, there was several guys that literally were there solely, Browns fans dressed in, you know, in their garb. They were there literally just to try and start a fire. I'm being serious. Like they weren't there to watch the game. They were there to use their mouth 
to try and start a fire. It's the title of this message today, the pyromaniac, right? The person that likes to start fires for fun. This was happening at the Steelers game. I was watching this happen. And like three or four rows down from us, there was one guy and he kept getting up and he wasn't excited that his team was winning. All he wanted to do was to just irritate the Steelers fans every time they made a good play. And so he kept jabbing and he kept jabbing and he kept jabbing. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life, right? Keep jabbing. When things don't go like you think they should, right? He tries to jab. He tries to speak a lie into your life. And I'm watching the breakdown of people's sanity. I mean, it was real, y'all. Like people's sanity started to break down. You have, you know, wives whispering in their husband's ears, you know, just sit down. Don't let him bother you, you know? And you see it starting to happen where there is this intentionality to start a fire. And we have to know when to starve out the wrong voice. We have to know when to close the door. Because let me tell you, there were literally people there that made a decision to leave because they knew that if they didn't leave, they were not going to be who they were supposed to be. You need to know when to leave when you're not going to be who you're supposed to be. And in this moment, we have to know how to close the door. See, firefighters, they know how to starve out a fire. They know what to do to starve out a fire. They remove the exposure of oxygen, of fuel, and of heat. And there are things that you need to remove exposure to in your life. You can think about it right now. What are things that are causing you to respond and react in ways that you shouldn't? I was reading a story about a fire in the Bronx. Really sad story. It killed 17 people. And when the firefighters were talking about what had happened, they said, what's so sad about this situation is that the fact is, is that they didn't do one simple action that would have prevented a lot of people from dying. They didn't close the door. And in these high-rise buildings in New York City, they literally have a law in place that requires apartments with three or more units to be outfitted with special hinges to close the doors on their own. And for some reason, these doors didn't close, and a lot more people died than needed to because the oxygen wasn't starved out. And so the smoke started to rise. When the door is left open, it provides a source of air that essentially acts as a pump fueling the flames. Come on, the enemy wants to fuel the flame in your life, and you have to know the things that you need to starve. If you starve something of both oxygen and fuel, it goes out quickly and naturally. And so what are the things in your life that God is asking you to starve? Self-control will starve out the fire in your mouth. Let's be real. Self-control, come on. This is as much for me as it is for you. I had a weekend that I didn't expect. I don't like change. And God's just, as I'm going through and looking at these notes, God's like, Amy, what's the confession of your mouth? Amy, what do you say? Amy, do you walk by faith even when it doesn't look like you expect it to look? I'm in this journey, right, just like you, of learning to walk by faith. Self-control is the best friend of wisdom. Self-control is the best friend of wisdom. Listen to Proverbs 16.32. It says, better a patient person than a warrior one with self-control than one who takes a city. The Bible is basically saying, you know, we want to look at the hero, right? The person that comes in and takes the city, the one that's in the movies. But in reality, what the word of God is saying, you have no business trying to take a city when you can't even control your own temper. You have no business even focusing on that when you're not willing to work on what's happening inside of you. And so your tongue when it's uncontrolled, is like a pyromaniac. It will try to light up fires in your life, in your relationships. It will try to do all kinds of things. And James, the book of James, is a great place to study about your speech, about your mouth. James 1.26, we're going to look at a lot of verses in James today. It says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Let's just drop the mic there, right? You know what I'm talking about. You've seen that person that tells you they love Jesus that they serve him, and then the things that come out of their mouth are nothing that represent that. 
How many times are we those people, right? The Bible says to rein in. Do you know what it means to rein in, to keep in check? You have to keep in check continuously your mouth, the things that you are allowing to come out of your mouth. And then James goes on because he really wants us to get it. He wants us to understand the power that this small little part of our body possesses. In James 3.3, he says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, right? That little area, the mouth, can turn and steer you in a completely different direction. And what you say will steer you into your tomorrow. Maybe you're not a horse person, right? Maybe you never lived on a farm, so James is going to take it a step further for you. Maybe you like to be on a cruise ship. He's telling you in James 3, 4, or take ships as examples. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Come on. How many times do we want to control where we go? And God is saying, nope, trust me. Take hold of the reins, keep in check what's coming out of your life because what you say, it will steer your tomorrow. Your words matter. I was reading this study and I've read several studies about married couples and their happiness. And this one said that in the first decade of marriage, they took couples in the first decade there was a group of couples that only had five times out of a hundred that they insulted each other or spoke badly towards each other. And then there was another group that did this twice as much. So 10 times out of a hundred. And they studied these couples over a decade. And what they found is the couples who were insulting themselves, their, their spouse, twice as much it just rapidly started to increase. By the end, the gap magnified so much over the next decade that they were flinging five times as many insulting comments at each other compared to happy couples. And this is what Notarius and Markman wrote in their book after this study was completed. They said, hostile put-downs, hostile put-downs, act as cancerous cells that if unchecked, erode the relationship over time. In the end, relentless, unremitting negativity takes control, and the couple can't get through a week without major blow-ups. And what they're saying is, how sobering is it? We want to say, well, their personality didn't mesh with mine. You know, we liked different things. But in reality, it's not about whether your personalities mesh. It's not about you being the most affectionate couple right? All these things that we think would cause failure in a marriage, it was all about the words that they spoke to each other. And they literally came up with this theory called the zinger theory. And this is what the zinger theory says. One zinger, one negative word, one negative comment can erase 20 acts of kindness the same way that a candy bar can wipe out 20 minutes of exercise. Ooh, I love me some candy bars. I'm just saying, I might, it might be worth it. <laughs> That's why it's so important that you find somebody who values you enough. It's not about not having good communication, not airing the dirty laundry, not, not working through it. It's about how you communicate. It's about how you respond to each other. And so I think if we're all being honest, if we were to do a little experiment ourselves right here today, and you were to take out a journal and you had recorded your entire conversation for a day and you transcribed it onto a journal and you started to read through it, what would it look like? Ooh, I do not want to look at that. It makes you think, huh? What would it look like? What are we representing? Because we are God's kids, And if we can't grab a hold of this truth about the power of what we speak and what we say and how we treat people, how do we expect anybody to find Jesus? How do we expect anybody to want him in their lives if we aren't communicating and we aren't valuing wise words in our life? And here's the thing, we'll never reach that zone, we'll never reach that place where we speak wise words fluently on our own. 
Not to discourage you, but look at James again. James 3.8 says, No human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. I mean, he's not mincing any words for us. There is no way that you or that I can come up with some strategy on our own to tame our tongue. It is humanly untamable. But the good news is that it's divinely tameable by the one who created it. We serve a God who gives us the ability to gain control of things in our life that we never would be able to without him. James 3.9 says this, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. I know you all will be ready for Pastor Jay next week after this. But seriously, we come in here, we worship God, we tell him how wonderful he is, and church is one of the worst places for it. Let's be real. The gossip, the church gossip, right? And then we walk out the doors and we talk about other people as though God didn't create them and love them, and value them, and we wonder why we don't feel fulfilled in our lives. Wise words, but we need the power of God to help us. We can't do it on our own. I love that when you look all throughout scripture, you see that God recognizes that we can't do it on our own. And he's willing to meet us there every step of the way. He is always present. Whatever you're walking through, in your life today, whatever you're facing, you are not alone. God is with you, he sees you, he has a plan for you, and the Bible is filled with examples to encourage you and remind you that that is true when you don't feel like you can know that on your own. Look what it says in Exodus. Exodus 4, Moses is asked by God to do something that he knows in the natural he is completely incapable of doing. And I love that God sees where Moses is. With his mouth, he's saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And God comes, and this is what he says in Exodus 4, who has made man's mouth? Like he doesn't already know the answer, right? He's, he's wanting Moses to get it. Hey, I created your mouth, Moses. I'm with you, Moses. You're not alone, Moses. And so he says, who has made man's mouth? Have not I, the Lord. Now go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. I love this. God tells you he will be with your mouth. You can get up in the morning and know that you don't have to try to do it on your own, that you don't have to try to speak and say the right things on your own, that God cares so much about that little part of your body that he's saying, I will be with you. And all through scripture, we see this. When Jesus was talking to his disciples in Mark 13, I can imagine the disciples were afraid. They knew they were going to be arrested. And Jesus is giving them instruction. And he says to them, don't worry in advance about what you're going to say Say when you stand trial. Don't try to come up with something that you're going to say in advance. He says, just what God tells you at the time, for it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Like, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to show up for you. The Holy Spirit shows up for you in your life. When you say yes to a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells in your life. And he's going to show up for you when you need him. And so you can not have to be concerned. I don't know the right words to say because the Holy Spirit is going to show up for you. But you're not just a puppet in this process. God wants you to partner with him. God wants you to partner with what he wants to do. We have to play our part. We have to go humbly before the Lord and play our part. I think if we're being honest, we often allow our emotions to rule us and to be so loud that we can't hear the words of God. One of the greatest tests that you will have of emotional intelligence is not acting in the moment. The power of the pause. And Jesus knew the power of the pause. You can see there were many times in his ministry where he made the decision to be silent, when he could try and defend himself. 
I love that Jesus knew how to do this well. Isaiah 53, 7 says, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. Matthew 26, 62, the high priest asked Jesus, are you going to answer these charges? But Jesus remained silent. See, we have to know when to remain silent. We have to know when the power of the pause is what we need. And Jesus knew what those moments were. Jesus understood the principle of James 119. He understood it and he lived it out. It says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I think if we're being honest, we're so quick to speak. Gosh, I can think of so many times, even in my marriage, I'm usually the first one to speak. (laughs) I got something to say. I'm coming in fighting, you know, I'm ready to win. And Jonathan has so many times in our relationship said, Amy, like, take a breath. Take a breath. How many times do you just need to stop for a moment to breathe in the goodness of God to be reminded that he is always with you and to pause before you start to speak. How many relationships, how many friendships have been ruined or have been wounded because we don't understand James 1.19, because we don't walk in it. But I love that we're not left hanging to try to figure it out on our own. And there are people in this room today, you feel like you're alone on this journey. And let my voice remind you this morning that the voice of the Lord is always speaking to you, is always for you. I love this scripture, Isaiah 54. It says, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. This is the God that we serve. He says, hey, I'm not gonna leave you hanging out in the deep end. Allow me to instruct your tongue. Do you know what that phrase means in scripture, instructed tongue? It means someone who takes up knowledge or beliefs from a teacher. And I see this picture of Jesus in a classroom and there's a seat right up front for you and there's a seat right up front for me and he says come and sit down receive everything that I have to give you receive everything that I have to teach you don't take a seat in the back don't allow the distractions don't allow the fires to keep you focus in on me there's always a seat for you at my table there's always a place for you with me and him instructing us and guiding us. Come on, the word says that he wakens me morning by morning, every day, every morning, God has something for you to hear. But in reality, I think what ends up happening is that we allow a lot of other things to instruct our tongue. Bitterness has been my teacher. I've been sitting in the classroom of bitterness. I've been sitting in the classroom of unforgiveness for so long that that's all that I hear. And so when I hear that, that's what comes up out of me and that's what I speak out. I've been living in the classroom of insecurity when there's always a door that's open to go in and meet with Jesus where he wants to instruct you with the truth. Walk into his door because what you hear, this verse, if you look, It says, he wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. You know what that means? What we hear really matters too. And I think we've allowed a lot of artists on our playlist that have no business being there. Come on, when you make a playlist on your iPhone, you get to pick and choose what artist is in there. You have to make a decision to shut out certain voices, to close certain doors, to allow yourself to be instructed by the one who created you and made you and knows what you are called to. And I believe God is asking us to edit the playlist. Edit the playlist so that what you hear 
will change what you declare. Because what you hear, if you hear the promises of God, he is speaking them over you morning by morning. I guarantee you it will start to change what comes out of your mouth. And all over this room, I know this is a hard word, but it's for me as much as it is for you. I just want you to know God loves you so much. He has something so important for you to do on this earth, people for you to reach. Do not discount his purpose for your life. I want you to close your eyes this morning. One of the greatest decisions that you will ever make is to walk through the door of relationship with Jesus. If you have never said yes to a life-giving relationship with him, if you have maybe walked away from that relationship, do not miss this moment and this opportunity. As a church, we are supporting you and we will pray with you. We're gonna say a salvation prayer. It's the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. So church, let's say this together. Dear Jesus, thank you for paying the price on the cross for my sins. I ask for forgiveness. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. And I will serve you and walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, if you said that prayer, you made a decision to say yes to Jesus today, would you raise your hand this morning? We wanna support you on that journey. If you're here this morning and you feel discouraged,